Welcome to You Talking with Greg. Uh, I'm, uh, Rich Blundell is returning. Uh, we had an initial conversation uh, where we explored Oika and love of the planet and its relationship to You Talk and their interfaces. Uh, Rich continued a conversation with John Bervakey, which I listened to not too long ago. Um, and so this is an extension of this very interesting set of interrelations that I think have an enormous amount of potential. Um, and as I, as I was just saying before we hit play, you know, I built you talk through an academic enterprise analyzing the problem of psychology and psychotherapy. Um, that's pretty far away from nature. Uh, and yet at the same time, what ultimately emerges is a what is fundamentally the relationship between the natural world and our psyches? What's the right relationship to that? Um, and I think that there is a lot of beauty in Rich's journey uh, that speaks to a lot of wisdom in relationship to that. And so that's an overarching theme uh, between us. Rich, welcome back. Good to see you. Hey, thanks. Good seeing you too, Greg. Uh, we were just talking a little bit before we started recording, and um, I was explaining to Greg how, you know, just my professional life has sort of flung me into this situation where there's all these opportunities to talk about this stuff uh in in new communities of mm -hmm. of 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 our of our population i guess yep. new parts of, let's say uh new facets of our culture lovely have have suddenly been granted an opportunity to speak about the things that we're talking about in this little corner of the internet right in terms of like big ideas big history the the natural history of consciousness the natural history of humans that kind of thing uh -huh. and so i've been able to talk a little bit about these things um in unexpected places with and and it's been it's been fascinating to like uh to watch how it gets received because it is i feel like there are certain things that we're talking about that register uh, in culture and the culture seems really ready to hear it mm -hmm. or at least ready to hear something, to hear something new. And so I've just been able to witness how when, 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 we're, when we're able to talk about these things and we have an audience and we have some attention, man, the, the, the room really, the, the room really tunes in to, to what's being said, which is, which is really hopeful, I think, and it feels like feels like a good uh, a good synergy. Um, but the other thing is that um, all of this stuff that's been going on has has in some ways <laughs> distracted me from the mm -hmm. the conversations that we had going on because they're pretty mm -hmm. they're pretty you know deep conversations. Mm -hmm. And you know once you um, sorry I'm just changing something here once you um, once you once you tune out of the conversations the deep conversations that when you kind of get cobwebs about it so mm. i was hoping that maybe we could spend just a little bit of time doing a little bit of a recap sure. mostly for me just to bring me back up to speed to where mm -hmm. where we were okay. and where we are right uh, as, as a refresher in some right. sense um yes let's definitely do that uh but let me just uh, invite you to say a little bit more about the uh, the context that you're in your science in residence am i a scientist yeah. in residence or, or you have a scholar in residence kind of position on Nantucket. Can you share just a little bit more about the sure, position this you is, find um, yourself in? Sure. It's uh, it's really it's fascinating. It's an organization that I have been sort of eyeing from across Nantucket Sound for some time. Okay. Um, it's an island off the coast of Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. It has this rich, rich history. I was a whaling port, you know, back in the 17 mm -hmm. and 1800s. And you know, it was very it gained a lot of affluence, uh, but then because of economic and geographic changes, you know, the, the whaling industry shifted to New Bedford on the mainland. Mm -hmm. And so this island, though, and it's been through these sort of these sort of periods of boom and bust. But what's really fascinating too, I mean, besides just the you know the early early colonial history, you know, when the first uh, Europeans came and you know colonized mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. New England, sure. Plymouth, and you know there's that whole story. The the this island of Nantucket had a relatively peaceful um, period with you know between the 
mm. the Native Americans and the. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But jumping ahead to the, um, you know, the the the, the, the whaling part. It, what's really interesting is that people who lived here, you know, would these whaling ships would go off and sell around the world for years, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. often a year or more. Mm. And in that time, they would take on crew members from wherever they happen to be, you know, right. whether that's Polynesian sure. islands or the Caribbean mm -hmm. or Cape mm -hmm. Verdeans or mm -hmm. West Africans or, and these people would join the crew mm. and, you know, and, and they all came with their different skills and things. And sure. there was this whole, this whole sort of governance system on ships where mm. you could ascend the ranks based on, you know, merit really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, what would happen is that these ships would then come back and they they would bring people from all over the world mm. and they would integrate into this little com island community. And huh. so this island community is this really unique influx of people from all over the world who were seen not as necessarily as immigrants, but as as like really valued right members Some of meritorious members. Yeah. Yes. And and it like and it was just sort of taken for granted that that anybody could anybody could could participate and succeed hmm. and hmm. and so it had this it had this it was this really weird little microcosm of uh, of, of an, an equality state hmm. you know and mm -hmm. uh that persisted throughout the booms and it's still here you know it's like it's yeah. it's it's present and um so it's it the island has this really rich unique history that um it's just very fertile ground mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. for lots of things it, so it turns out it's a place where ideas are can emerge big ideas there's a certain comfort level with big ideas out here wow. and so as i was saying like after i you know had my whole life in the adventures of science and doing all that stuff mm -hmm. and i sort of came back to my home habitat because that's mm -hmm. what this is mm. And um, I started, you know, watching this organization that's out that's out here, and it's called the Mariah Mitchell Association. So it's mm -hmm. it's founded to preserve the legacy of a woman mm. uh, who discovered a comet. You know, she has this incredible history too. And mm -hmm. but she was this really. She came from Quaker background. She mm -hmm. she she lived out here. She discovered this comet, won this big award, and this mm -hmm. set her off on this sort of trajectory of science celebrity she became a you know eight, mm -hmm. a, a 19th century science celebrity and she was mm -hmm. the first woman inducted into the national academy of arts and sciences wow. she became a astronomy professor at vassar mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. but she just and but the really interesting thing too is that she was she became friends with a lot of the people you know the the influential people of the time mm -hmm. she's hanging out with the transcendentalists you know mm -hmm. thoreau, mm -hmm. thoreau um mm -hmm. just all those guys mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and she was also very much a, a women's rights activist mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. was just hanging out with the alcott sisters and a lot of literary literary herman melville and mm -hmm. nathaniel okay. hawthorne and mm -hmm. so it's this real eclectic and she's a scientist. She was also very much into nature. You know, there's mm. these stories of her having um, this practice of long walks in contemplation and observation mm -hmm. of nature. Mm. You know, what we would maybe today call forest bathing. She was like the original. Mm. Uh -huh. She wouldn't say that given you know, right. her Quaker Puritan sure. sort of. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But, you know, she had so she had this nature practice. Mm. She was a birder. You know, she. Mm -hmm. And so this organization now that has. Uh, that that is here to sort of preserve her legacy finds itself you know in this very unique position that mm. it's got all the elements basically of big history and this is kind of what mm -hmm. i saw i was like this is what right, really right, attracted right. me to it's like well you've got an astronomer who's really into nature mm -hmm. she's got all this cultural influence and interaction mm -hmm. she you know she was a thought leader uh, 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 you know equality uh, things so it's like they're doing big history and they don't even know it. And mm. and so I approached them, you know, last year and said, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. let's do something. And so mm -hmm. I've now uh, so we've sort of invented this position as a as a visiting scientist, as a kind right. of trial run. Mm 
Okay. But it's just opened up these amazing opportunities to to talk about the things we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Talk about, mm -hmm. you know, talk about deep philosophy, cognitive science, natural history, big history. Right. The revolutions in in in, in the psycho psychological fields, you know, all of these things that we're talking about, it suddenly there's this place that it, it just seems to fit. It it dovetails. And so that has opened a lot of opportunities to um and so I'm finding myself uh suddenly standing in front of you know groups of people mm -hmm. saying the shit right. we talk about and i'm just and i'm <laughs> just in like saying, last night right <laughs> like last night and and what surprises me more than anything is the receptivity to what what i'm saying i'm, I'm saying stuff that needs to be said mm -hmm. and uh and it, it 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 catches i hear it catching you know engaging mm -hmm. and so it's exciting and yeah. we'll see where it goes you know, but um, it's 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 new territory for me. It's um, lovely, I, and I just think a lot of things are coming together in in a way. So I feel a lot of pressure not to blow it too. Like I I, I want to represent what we're doing with with integrity, so that mm -hmm. it it mm -hmm. um and live up to it. You know, because mm -hmm. frankly, you know, I'm I'm out of my league in some ways. Mm. In many ways, I'm out of my league here. Like mm -hmm. I'm really just an ex fisherman. You know, I'm really just this <laughs> dude who loves to be on the trail and, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. communing with birds and right, stuff right. like that. So it's just really exciting. So anyway, that's, uh, yeah. that's, that's lovely. Why, yeah. Well, that's why I've been sort of like, uh, mm -hmm. uh not so much in, having the conversation. So I wanted, that's why also why I wanted to like spend a little yeah. time. Let's, can we ease back into this totally. and yeah. see where we're, we're at? Because I know you're, you know, you're, you're making a lot of progress. Your books come out. I, I listened to you talk 20 stuff, which is amazing. And I want to, you know, dive into that a little bit, but also figure out now where, how we're advancing this thing, you know, based yeah. on kind of what I'm seeing and yeah. what I'm experiencing in the world. Yeah. Where can we kind of go from here? Because it does uh, feel like this does feel like this is a big opportunity somewhere in here. Amen. Lovely. And that's why I, um, I, I really appreciate you recounting that. Um, so for me, the reason I appreciate you recounting is, is like, you know, um, my journey is, you know, i fall into the ideas. I'm embedded in the academic institution, the traditional academic institution. I think I'm going to follow then the influence of the ideas through the academic institution. And that really just doesn't happen. Um, the way the ideas fall, you say you're sort of right in the right place, potentially, of a particular intersection of influence and awareness and time and readiness. I'm actually would say that I wasn't in the right place academically. The field of psychology was, you know, sort of like, still situated in its, you know, reconsolidated identity of, hey, we're okay with just being a science because we do the methods of science. We're not interested in, you know, big theory still. Um, and and they're between a modern and postmodern view of the world and this metamodern sort of theoretical integration system is still not structured. In it. And, and if you don't have the ear of the institution, and if it's not really looking for stuff, it's just not going to pay any attention. That's what I then discovered. And so I, I kept going deeper and deeper into the analytics of what it is that I was doing and the implications at the idea level. And then of course, went from the unified theory of knowledge uh, to psychology, the unified theory of knowledge, it turns into a garden and a coin and, you know, gets weirder <laughs> in terms of. Can, what... I, can I just interject one thing? Yeah. Do you think that like these struggles or these, you know, just these dynamics that you're talking about, which seem that th they take a lot of, they seem to share a lot of these, these are, generalizable to what's going on in across all the sciences right very much so. and very and much so. it's it's kind of classic paradigm even Kuhnian paradigm shift stuff dynamics that are, are going on so i mean i i think i think you're you know you're focusing in on psychology which is incredibly important and that and the field is clearly ripe for it uh for the for the for the disruption mm -hmm. and the, almost the overhaul uh so i i but do you see it though as part of the it's kind of the status quo in terms of science revolutions right totally. so it's exactly. part of that totally yeah so i mean the science i mean if we just do a basic kunian thing we'll put it in a little you talk language people yeah. will build systems of justification that legitimize paths of behavioral investment that get institutionalized okay once you get an institutionalized structure you have a market structure you have an organizational structure you have mm. all of the journals you have all of the peer review you have all of the ways in which individuals dialogue and they build a system of justification which places constraints and 
legitimization functions on an entire system. Yeah. If you come outside of that with a different legitimizing function that then can essentially deconstruct major aspects of it, the system itself from a cognitive dissonance perspective will find anxiety in that. It has to have a strong motive. There's gotta be some clear element that motivates the desire to go to that you know, anxiety. So the system has to be in trouble. If the system's not really in trouble in a particular way, or there's no systematic press upon it, then, then there's no need to, to do anything. Now, so from my vantage point, the way the system structured essentially became blind to the need, so it's not aware of the need, and it is not really experiencing a particular press that's unique. What we're seeing now is there's an entire press that's emerging across the entire modern, postmodern, justificatory institutional structure. So now what we're seeing is, a, is an increasing press of the felt sense that our knowledge and institutional structures are just not up to the task in general, <laughs> mm, right? That's right. what I think really is emerging. It's like, so now you see, yes, it was, you know, psychology was comfortably in denial, but actually, hey, sociology is comfortably in denial. Shit, there's aspects of physics that are sort of, you know, the entire structure, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. sort of like, how do we make sense out of the world? Well, and then my, along comes, come, and I don't mean to plug it, but then along comes big history, you know, like, here's a, here's a framework to like, now let's rethink how we fit into this. Totally. And so it, it, it makes sense. It's exciting as hell too, I think. Right. It, it, and that's, I, I actually have been working recently with Tyler Volk. Um, and we've been talking about a big history 2.0. I mean, that's what we're actually thinking about mm -hmm. really um, engaging ourselves. So I, I really read his uh, Quirks to Culture and, and understand his structure. Um, and then now I'm fusing that with you talk and I'm helping him understand yeah. that a lot of what he says. So Tyler, you know, does the Quirks to Culture and he's got levels. And what dawned on him is actually there are levels and there are these realms. There's a physical realm, a biological realm and a cultural realm. Mm -hmm. okay? And that corresponds to big histories model, but they miss the mental evolution animal realm from a Utah perspective. The Utah says there are four realms or dimensions, matter like mind at the animal level and then culture person. And you have to get the divisions right. Um, and if we get that right, then the map from the thresholds perspective of big history gets actually gets a lot more specifiable. And at least from my vantage point, a lot more tightly knit between our scientific knowledge and the actual rise to use Tyler Volk's term of combogenesis, which is my term for complexification. And man, if we get that right, then the specificity of big history takes a qualitative jump. Forward. Yeah, I think I think we're going to find they're, they're missing more than just that organismic gap too. I think it's... Well, I th then, yes, I think that the 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 clarity about the gaps on, on from a scientific ontological perspective is missing. And then I think your insight actually, um, certainly it corresponds to, at least has deep parallels as we were just talking off camera with the tree coin relation. It's like, well, there's the sort of the scientific view of this. Okay. And then there's the subjective realization of it in the embodiment of being. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, if I listen to your story, you're sort of like, hey, I'm watching this thing. And then it's like, wait a minute. It's not just about watching this thing. It's like I'm like being this thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right? no, no, yeah. But that's an inescapable thing once mm -hmm. you, once, once, you uh, once you pile up enough, once you pile up enough scientific knowledge, you know, it, it, that bleeds into socio you know sociological domains and physics domains you know you you, you it's in, inescapable sort of there's the ontological continuity is is inescapable and um well that's then it all, I, yeah then it became a practice for you right i mean you and, and that's that, that doesn't happen ever a lot of big history bro. like you you yeah which is why like uh, sign me up for big history 2.0 because that you know that's a fight i was fighting the whole way you know that yep. from day one and i was there at day one pretty mm -hmm. much you know yeah. like the first yeah. cohort of phd students right. to come through the place to do big history mm -hmm. i mean i wasn't there at its founding of course there were the original founders right obviously but in, but in terms of when they brought that field to market yep. i was the, one of the and i from day one there was that mismatch there which was exciting because it was like i could see things i could see things Clearly. and i'm dealing with historians now that are using scientific language they're talking about scientific they're not doing science they and they and they're not quite sure where they you know where to position themselves which was which was frustrating because it's it looked sloppy you know in some ways it's like wait a second there's a difference between 
talking about scientific knowledge and doing science. We know that, right? And there's a difference between doing historical scholarship, good, rigorous historicals, and doing science. These are, they're on a continuum, but they're in some sense very, very different. And and I'm seeing the same thing now happen, you know, in the arts. Like, I, I have a lot of conversations with artists about, well, why isn't art considered, you know, why isn't it like a more... Um, um, why isn't it a more uh, legitimate source of knowledge? And da 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 da. Well, it's just these are just different activities. But the point, I guess, is just saying that that frustration with 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 big history. And, and, and look, I'm not like complaining about it yeah, because no. I think I, I think it's a, a normal mm-hmm. and and you know um, noble process mm-hmm. to go through. Totally. It's not easy, but it's it, it, you know, but it's 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 exciting. Right. And, well, that's a, we can pick, think of this as in developmental terms, as far as I'm concerned. Yes. yes. Okay. So, so that we, was, but anyway, okay. sign me up for that 2.0 mm-hmm. because, mm-hmm. you know, with the assumption though that it's also going to be 3.0 and 4.0 and of it's going to it's going to evolve. Um, so where are we now? Like, um, you know, I, 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 I listen to your framework, and I, mm-hmm. I think I have a sense it's it's richer than I can sort of, than I can grok all at once, but. Um, the parts where I think it's the parts where I think where I feel the most excitement mm-hmm, mm-hmm. is actually, you know, there's the deep continuity hypothesis. I, I where I feel the excitement is is the part that's actually a little deeper than the deep continuity hypothesis. Like, okay. at what point do we transition from things? Things happening, you know, in the physical, in in, in physics, and or just natural sort of like processes, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and the thing that would later come to be called consciousness. Totally. You know, like where is where where is that? Um, where do you put that? If you put it anywhere, if yeah. there is one, I don't think there is one. But where do we put that sort of break between what we think of as purely physical mm-hmm. happening yep. and organismic doing like totally right like yeah yeah no the uh, right so the i mean uh you talk gives a particular structure to that both the continuity and the discontinuity yep and, and it affords i think a pretty good gripping function on what we know and what we don't know but affords knowledge in a way that's been cumulative regarding what we know and gets us clearer and clearer yep. um while also revealing and certainly maintaining all sorts of Flexibility, uh, potential wrongness in the system. Um, that's that's I mean, got to have a ripple effect in every field that it touches, so, so, right? Yeah. I th- I, well, certainly, the, it, to the extent that we're actually able to network our structures together in, with that with that sort of epistemic, and I'll come back to that word, and ontological continuity in particular ways that afford cumulative coherence. I mean, to the extent we've to do that, then you get a ripple effect of change across all sorts of different elements. I mean, the, the vision logic of the of the tree of knowledge, you know, uh, says, okay, out of an energy implicate, information implicate order, you get an organization of frozen energy complexification. Um, and then you can track the development of that through nested holarchies or combinogenic structures, both within a particular level of particle to atom to molecule, then across scale, and you have emergent aggregate properties. However, all of that remains. Uh, in a potentially uh, what most people call weak emergence and then essentially a a pretty, a a good reductive physicalist program works from particle physics to chemistry across scale to planets and stars, okay? But something different happens at the level of life. Um, And and Utah argues that the thing that actually happens is the self-organizing processes yeah. Um, as a function of the negentropic autopoetic structures that we can get into, um, create a membrane of an input-output structure that actually can be framed as a novel epistemic, come back to that term, and, and there's a kind of biological intelligence knowing structure. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that we need to understand that biological intelligence knowing structure by bringing an information processing architecture and communication network architecture mm. uh, to explaining it. Um, and, and to then describe and explain the complex organism d- adaptive dynamics about how organisms exhibit functional awareness and responsivity in a mm. way that tornadoes do not. Okay, the functional awareness and responsivity is a function of the information processing structures and communication networks. 
And if you want to understand more clearly, we can get into the details, but the way a system operates on an information processing actually eliminates the capacity to explain it as a function of microscopic um, particle analysis, mm -hmm, precisely because mm -hmm. the epistemic function is operating on the macroscopic form and is determined by the macroscopic form. Actually, Sean Carroll, who misses this point, got in a conversation with a nail Seth on it in his podcast, and they actually rode this conclusion, mm. if you know how to listen to their conversation. Um, and it's actually the correct answer for why emergent epistemic processes, which are depicted visual logic in the tree of knowledge, are not effectively mm. reducible in any way, in the same way that chemistry mm -hmm. is reducible mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. atoms. So the short answer to that I would give is, well, there's a complexification process, okay? If you want to take sort of a spiritual continuity, quasi pan psychic view or whatever, okay, that complexification is a, there's an integrated information network that does have a trail of continuity. So this is the continuity argument, okay? Mm. But there's then a self-organizing discontinuity that is captured by the different cones of complexification as opposed to a single cone. So it's both continuous, uh, continuous and discontinuous continuous depending on what aspect we're emphasizing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but the key in terms of what i would say we you, you use the term consciousness well we have to know what our referent is the most general definition of consciousness is something that exhibits functional awareness and responsivity okay when you say hey that guy's unconscious mm. what do you mean okay you but we've already but we've already really solved the problem that I mean, like in other words i'm really comfortable with everything you just said like it all mm -hmm. Okay. No problem. It's like I, right. there's no there's no controversy here. You know, okay. and if there is Good. one, fine. I agree. Let's, right. So then, actually, let's you let's talk and Trey Miles is very very conservative in terms of just sort of a general set of already agreed upon information that is networking together that affords right. consensus. So and then okay. there's this this residual so reluctance, but there's this residual well, reluctance. The, 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 there are a lot of reasons for that. But well, and there's a lot of it's well founded. I get it. Like you don't mm -hmm. you just we need to we need to be very cautious and right. protect hard won scientific knowledge mm -hmm. that's not to say science is the end all but right. it just means that you know let's no. not throw out the baby with the bathwater. so, so, so yeah. we're there okay so yeah. now what what's the next question well i think we I, but what's really interesting to me is how this intersects with the culture how this intersects with the meaning crisis like mm. so what does this mean to the meaning crisis like okay. and can we come up with language and we can we come up with scenarios by which this starts to register in the collective uh human presence on the planet and how can we heal how can we undo yep. how can we look forward and see prosperity and work toward it and you know not to make any grandiose claims mm -hmm. or sh we're not shooting for utopia here that's not the, yep. obviously totally. but how can we get ourselves out of this fucking mess yep. and you know the at least the bad parts of it but and do bet do it better and mm -hmm. and, and and be prepared mm -hmm. for whatever the future holds so yeah. and and you know people like john and others have articulated the meaning crisis in, yep. in really palpable ways agreed that i wish would i wish would find a bigger audience of course mm -hmm. so that you know that we so that we were all sort mm -hmm. of aligning with mm -hmm. with, with, mm -hmm. with the bigger project here mm -hmm. Um, so that's what I, that's what I'm really interested in is yeah. I, I'm kind of looking at both ends of the spectrum here. What's going on down there at the atomic, yeah. subatomic, quantum totally. scales that we can begin to identify with up here yeah. at this mm -hmm. at this scale. Yeah. But then also, how can we apply all of this transformation right. to you know, in a cultural level, and something that's attractive? Right. And I mean that literally, like right. well, and figuratively, like it's attractive mm -hmm. in a basin of attraction and uh filled fills us with complete good feelings <laughs> yeah yeah well here uh, um I'll, I'll bridge off of conversation that alexander barr was having with dan schmachtenberger not too long ago on parallax um and they although they come at this like i come at this in very different ways um they quickly framed the current situation in terms of attractors okay um and they identified three broad attractors one was a chaotic attractor, okay? Things are wobbling, they're gonna get more wobbling and ultimately you're gonna get global civilization collapse, okay? So the chaos attractor. To try to control for the chaos attractor, there are, you know, you're gonna get totalitarian structures. Uh, and so a third, a second chaos, uh, a second attractor is totalitarian control to try to downregulate um, where power structures emerge and you get a 1984 scenario, which mm -hmm. in the digital landscape mm -hmm. is a lot more plausible mm -hmm. uh because if you can control the information flow in the digital landscape in a radically sure. different way than you could before 
So you have, so both in terms of risk, if Dan, Daniel Schmeichenberg is a global risk uh, assessment, you got Matt, two big attractors given increasing sort of chaos about how A, it will fall down or people will try to control it from falling down and then produce totalitarian state. And so then it's like, well, we don't want either one of those attractors, right? right. Uh, there's a, th is there a third attractor that is much more optimal uh, and sustainable in relationship to basic human values when we can look at both of those attractors and saying, fuck, I don't want to live, I don't want to die and I don't want to live in 1984, right? right. Um, so that's a basic, so then now what would be the natural, what's the nature of that attraction? Uh, I think uh, the, the good news is, is that there's more of a collective awakening that mm -hmm. the system is wobbling, there's mm -hmm. dangers, and mm -hmm. we need to think systematically about a fundamental upgrade in our operating system mm -hmm. to change some of the way the variables are working. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, and you're then, you, I think, just of your description of, hey, where you are, and you, yeah, granted, it's a unique place, but people with power and influence are feeling this, obviously. You're, the room listens when you're like, hey, here's a new, scientifically grounded, but also really, it's got a fusion of values. You can see it in the way you operate in the world. You, you love being you love nature there's a particular way in which you're exemplifying meaning which i think is part of the meaning crisis is a starving of the sacred it's a starving of these kinds of things so you can embody a scientific worldview that also embodies a structure of being in the world that is so alive that many people are craving so and then if we say well what would that look like there, there are a lot of different pragmatic and institutional and analytics and and embodied structures um but at a general level, what I think this conversation about is like, yeah, what are the kinds of features of the third attractor? Um, and, and then how are we syncing up for those of us that have aspects of that? Mm. Uh, and for me, the alignment of self with the natural world, okay, the alignment of the subject of qualitative experience of being in the world in coherent alignment with the natural world is unbelievably crucial. Uh, if we're going yeah. to find this world attractor. And so this is where I think you and I are like very easily, I listened to you on John, uh, you know, five minutes into your conversation, like I got to reach out to that guy um, precisely because there's that kind of resonance. Yes. And to, and to think that we would like be able to just pick up and run like, you know, the, the clear mandate. I think that's un. It's not. They're not. Not. There's no. I, it's not reasonable I mean, to do. Let, but I do talking, think there are th there are certain things that are built into this. That, like for one thing, it's communicative. Something about the system has this suddenly this 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 very highly enhanced communicative capacity, which mm -hmm. is like now it's there. Mm -hmm. Thus far, it's been used for the old stuff, advertising, you know, political mm -hmm. strife, mm -hmm. whatever you want, yep, yep. however you want to use it. So there is, but there is that potential that's there. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the other thing I was going to say was just that. Um, oh, that that that. So what it what I'm what I'm thinking is that we need some kind of a proxy, like because people can't kind of live the way I do. I mean, very mm -hmm. few can actually yeah. like spend carve out enough time in direct contact with nature to hear it speak. You know, yeah. it takes it takes a lot of time it has to be a priority and that's not so there needs to be some kind of proxy mm. and i think your framework in hmm. some ways it harbors the opportunity for that proxy like there's there's something in there that's attractive that you know doesn't mean you have to go get lyme disease every year you know like an, which is an issue you know it's mm -hmm. just like yeah, fair enough and, you know, people don't want to be uncomfortable. And I get that, you know, mm -hmm. like in being in nature is often uncomfortable. And mm -hmm. um, so I think that's one area that we could work on. It's like, what is that? What is that new experience of nature that is that is that is not doesn't mean you have to live like a Paleolithic person. It doesn't right. mean you have to cross an ocean or climb a mountain or you, know, you can live a comfortable modern life and still have access to the the, the richness of nature in in your home or sure. you know in your in the world that's accessible readily accessible to you and then that can start a, a relationship once 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 that relationship has sort of started with uh -huh. Uh -huh. and it, it it part of it is internal to the to the human who has to make uh -huh. the decision to have that uh -huh. relationship uh -huh. but once that relationship starts and the conversation begins yep. then it's exponential, you know, like we're yeah. talking, we're talking about nature here. We're talking about the thing that has created 
all of this. Right. And so it's a it's 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 an extraordinarily powerful creative force. And so once the conversation starts, it's going to it's going to manifest in ways that that are beyond our control. You know, totally. between you and nature, and yep. nature's going to start showing you things. You know, mm-hmm. in, in some sense, it's like a, it's like a psychedelic experience uh, without having to ingest the psych, like, you know, the substance. Yep. So, um, yeah, those are just those yeah. Are just well, I mean, I, 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 you know, here's so right. So my my relationship to that goes as follows. So if you know, if I if I go back in my development, say 2011, and about and publishing my first book, a new unified theory of psychology. Um, I wouldn't, and had heard you, if I'd heard you then, the immediate resonant wouldn't have been nearly as apparent because it's the way my mm. system has developed. I speaking for my own self, my own history, my own emphases. You know, I'm, I grew up in a normal suburban home or that's emphasized a lot of academics, um, but it's, it's structured in a modern techno system. I'm not, uh, I mean, I like going when I'm a kid, get crayfish in the, but I'm, it's not, my love of nature is not um, part really of my own, framing or what I would say, oh, we need to solve the problems. Of course, I don't really understand the global problems in the same way I do now back then. But I'm an academic doing academic things. And then the system grows from a unified theory of psychology into this unified theory of knowledge. And of course, the fundamental conduit was the transformation of the tree of knowledge, which was really this a statement about our analytics and our mythos within our analytic propositional mm-hmm. knowing mm-hmm. that then becomes the guard, okay? the guard. And then as it becomes the garden, the embodied participatory interaction, to use some 4 cognitive science language, just explodes onto the scene Mm. for me, just in terms of, and then my life is then the metaphor of my life is essentially a, what I would call a garden fractal. Mm -hmm. So the garden fractal is what is my local garden look like? And then what is the fractal garden in relation? And as soon as I put that logos on my system, the transformation to my relationship to the world and in particular highlighting just what i was blind to in relationship to nature became mm. much more salient wow and, that's and, a cool idiosyncratic generate you know origin mm-hmm. story and i think there's a lot i think that would have resonance with lots of people who we need to who we need in this you know who we need to participate in this uh i'm really uh intrigued by um well, I'm intrigued by where you go from here, you know, like the, the, the higher numbers on the, on the, you talk 20, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. maybe even let's get right to the number. Is it 20? I think it's 20. The coin is 20. If that's what you're after. What's 19. The elephant's sun God. Yeah. Um, I would like to explore the potential for a crayfish sun God, you know, that, cool. that what, that, that this thing though, but these, these moments when we're young and we are, Mm. You know, and we ah. haven't accumulated all of the cognitive conceptual right. stuff and we suddenly we're back with the crayfish again and 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 that's you know i feel that too like the, the, I'm, I'm very much in touch with the phenomenology of that child being right. being at, being with without right. all of that and so i just i think that that could there's something of potential there. There's some potential there. Well, shortly after I built the garden, uh, I connected with an early educator and an instructional designer. Um, and we uh, gave the schematic, a brief schematic of what a kindergarten would look like. Mm-hmm. You know, that you could build a nursery school into a kindergarten um, where the entire structure of the kindergarten is a garden. In fact, that's where the word originally comes from. Mm-hmm. Um, and an educational embodiment of one's, you know, the embodied experience that kids come at three, four, five, six, ready to be. That is our primate nature. Yeah. Right. <laughs> in, in relation. And then we stamp it out of them. So we get them socialized into the technocratic linguistic yeah. propositional world. Yeah. You know, that's the that is the current structure of our socialization stru- systems. And that it that needs a fundamental reset. That means that we need to rotate that. And of course, a number of educators have sort of seen that, but that's and the garden, the, the at least the potential that I see in relationship, the garden can actually hold all of that analytic propositional knowledge and at the mm-hmm. same time maintain a mythos mm. and an embedded participation that puts us much closer to right relation to nature than our current market structure. Yeah, there's it seems there's like a process of you don't have to jettison all that all that that we gain, 
it's not the problem. It's only the problem when, when it's held to the exclusion of the six year old. And oh. uh, so then it's really just a process of, uh, in some way, recovering the memory of the six year old. Um, wow, Precise. which is kind of kind of a fractal of recovering the memory of the primate. Completely. The, 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 homin the hominid. Mm -hmm. um, you know what I mean? Like, um, oh, 100%. That's exactly yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly so right. cool. Like, how do we do this? Like, how do we just keep <laughs> doing this? And, you know, and um, it seems to me like we've got a lot of stuff worked out. And um, now it's just a question of living it, you know, and, and having the courage to present it, right. model it, um, exemplify things. So, so that's where exactly where I am. And like, I think that there's a lot of the analytics and the depth works out. And this is a totally new phase for me. I'm very excited. Um, I'm a little anxious. I'll be, I would be lying if I'm not a little anxious because it's not uh, this whole, hmm. okay, for me, um, I woke up to a particular talent that I had for abstraction, <laughs> theoretical, psychological, philosophical abstraction. And then I dove into a rabbit hole that I loved um, and was talented at by myself, basically. <laughs> for my speak my own little journey um but now is the time for something uh different now is the time for exactly what you just laid out there's a, there's something that's here that needs to then be metabolized into something that grows is embodied is is cultivated and, and then how what that looks like and how you do it how you interface with those systems that's exactly sort of the what do you think I feel myself. what are your thoughts on like the role of art in all of this I mean, I think unbelievably crucial. Uh, I think that the, I mean, first off, uh, the creative expression of the arts immediately speaks to, um, you know, uh, the intuitive perspectival participatory. We'll use, mm. you know, so we can, John, afford, John Rebecca is affording us a nice set of languages um, that basically emphasize that a lot of our education is propositional. I would say propositional, justificatory, analytic. Okay, we're, and then we're going to learn, we're going to learn how to do tech. And we're going to have the implication that we're going to sit over and control nature. That's a, you know, um, but that's not the relation that we, we're going to transform into a more holistic, what I call the wisdom stack from energy to matter, to life, to mind, to culture across time in right relation, um, you know, uh, to the crayfish sun God. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then t that means then we need a, a whole nother or a whole more set of inclusive kinds of practices and embodiments so the arts afford us that creative exploratory structure mm. perspectival participatory knowing that i think have been underdeveloped um yeah or in in many ways and the interface between i mean one of the things that you talk then comes back to and the meaning in mental health crisis oh we actually there is a way to grab a hold of the soul and spirit in a naturalistic world there are absolutely ways to understand those concepts, to embrace those concepts, to have awe in those concepts, to be consistent. I mean, elephant, sun guy, you know, what a, a garden. There's a mythos here that's part of our capacity. And that's not inconsistent with science, but the way I learned in school, you know, I, I mean, I, ah, you know, you know, this is real knowledge. I did all of it. You know, it's like, oh my God, you know, the, the mm. more holistic, scientifically grounded structure about our system affords a much more complete picture that then realizes that you're basically clapping with one reductive mechanistic hand over here. <laughs> and, and, and like, you know, that's missing the entire picture um, and blinding us to many, many things we need to be aware of. So I, I think yeah, and I think that that's, I think that's where art can play a really functional restorative role, I think. Oh. Uh, and when you put it that way, I mean, I'm, it's making me think about the work that I am doing with artists and how, you know, there are certain artists that have, you know, they're highly talented. You know, there's a lot of really talented artists out there, but that, but that are so far from this understanding, you know, that they're, for whatever reason, their, their, their lineage, their training, their expectations, whatever it is, it shut them off from this deep, openness to, to to collaborate with nature mm -hmm. but then there are other artists you know with also highly talented 
that are for some reason something happened some mm -hmm. some event some particular scenario of things that happened that actually left the door open mm -hmm. and i i think that's probably a really important and really um valuable area to plumb at this point is i would, I would totally agree with that. and so it's really you know and, and part of my work is to try to find those artists that have those sensitivities mm. that have those sensibilities and talent of course and mm -hmm. passion and energy and creativity mm -hmm. and um find those that are willing to like work from less of a sort of idiosyncratic egoic artist mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, position mm -hmm. to one that's more continuous, oh. to one that's more that has some way of establishing the continuity of the self oh. with the world, uh, and then that and then in there becomes this little portal through which world can speak through artist, oh. artist being an integral part of it, of course, mm -hmm. or... that's in, that's inescapable. But uh, that and then through that through that uh that relationship begin to infiltrate culture mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in in and uh and and have conversation around it this is what's actually happening it's, it's mm -hmm. actually quite beautiful to see i didn't i didn't plan it this way mm -hmm. but um what i'm seeing is like with the spe specific artists that i work with um they're it's fascinating actually there's one artist i work with rita rita leduc and she, um, we connected just sort of kind of, you know, this very um, haphazard way or just this mm -hmm. sort of like fluke of a thing. Mm -hmm. But we realized that we we're both onto something. Mm -hmm. Her practice, which is really unique, I think, in terms of the way it, it highlights the inactive, it, it highlights an inactive process where okay. she creates this frame, wooden frame, and puts this sh clear sheet of plastic on then looks through the front, looks through the plastic at some aspect of the world. It could be urban, but lately it's been nature. We've okay. been using nature and she can, she projects, you know, her perception through it and then pulls it forward to the, to the screen. Huh? Creates, you know, like what looks like a piece of art, you know, it's got okay. all the complexity and the texture and the, huh. all the light and, and it's, it's, abstracted in some way but it's also very much grounded in a in a in a particular perspective of the world and then there it is like it's on this representational surface Funky. which really um i think reveals the homunculus like mm. suddenly you find yourself looking at the representation of the world on a surface mm. that's mm -hmm. external to you but mm. it's easily transferable to the one that's actually mm. That we that that we mm -hmm. feel internal, right? Like, right, right, and it, right. And and it's sort of like, you know, pay no attention to that homunculus on the surface. Mm -hmm. You know, like it reveals that there is this, and then you get into this infinite regress of like, yep. well, wait a minute, who's the homunc? What homunculus is looking at the homunc? And then what you've done is, in some way, temporarily evicted the homunculus. Mm -hmm. So her mm -hmm. process is like deeply inactive, you know. Mm -hmm. And since that. it's happening in nature, and and mm -hmm. and this is really cool when I. We've done a few workshops and I watch her, you know, teach this to mm -hmm. participants mm -hmm. and I get to just sort of sit back and observe. And what I observe is people, as they do this, they go, you know, they, they, in some sense, disappear, you know, momentarily mm. when they're in that space, they, they have, they have sort of relinquished mm -hmm. ego long mm -hmm. enough for the world to speak. Love and so that. they're enacting this whole process and then and then there's a whole other sort of thing where the the artist comes back and mm. takes that takes that piece basically deconstructs it you mm -hmm. know mm -hmm. tears it down huh. reassembles it and then there's this you know real then the fine artist surfaces and and starts recombining textures and colors and 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 i'm in the whole in the whole time i'm i'm observing this i'm watching i'm we're we're exchanging ideas we're having deep philosophical discussions we're usually in the woods together. So we're like, we mm. know these places mm -hmm. intimately. Wow. And so like the work she's putting out now is this, you know, there's been several pieces that she's put. We started with this one yep. that it's called life cycle of a mushroom. People can look it up. Mm. But, but now the stuff she's putting out now, she's going back to that. We spent like 
12 days in the forest, you know, mm -hmm. doing these practices. Okay. And now the stuff she's creating is like, it's bringing me back too. Like mm. she goes back in, in her mm -hmm. imagination, mm. brings me back. And I see things like, I remember this one spot and like I can, and the way the light plays in this little valley and the way it accumulates. And then there's this boulder that's mm -hmm. in the way. And then mm -hmm. all this mm -hmm. stuff was, and, and I'm like suddenly back in the forest too. So she's brought me back in, right. in, in a sort of abstracted way, but it's, it's highly phenomenological, highly creative. Mm. But anyway, the point is just that what's going on now, it's, I'm going long on this, but we're starting to have this conversation in that world that right. has not been had before. Like, right. you know, we, we go to these galleries and we talk and it's, it's like we're speaking another language for the most part, which surprises me because I would think that, you know, I would think that it, everything's fair game in this, mm. but it's not. There's all these structures and restrictures mm. of the art world mm. that that are still present, but we're trying mm. to like, but mm. we're, and we're, we're finding ourselves up against them. Okay. Mm. But I, what I think is that there's a conversation happening uh, on the periphery of the art mm. that, that, is like that proxy. It's it's mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's it, perhaps that's the proxy that I'm thinking about. Like mm, that yep. that we can start to have these conversations around art, mm -hmm. where artists who are who are tuned into this thing yep. um, can then present opportunities for people like us right. to, to have language right. engagements with right. this this the artistic world and and who better to create culture than the artists isn't that what they so, do right. so mm -hmm. it just seems like there's 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 glimmers of what's what, what what's already happening i ah, love that yeah i don't know yeah. if that makes any sense or not oh it makes total sense i mean and then sort of in terms of like interface so so these proxies that would afford this sort of science art science spirituality um knowledge culture interface is yeah i mean so the, you talk diagnosis us as living in a chaotic, fragmented pluralism. Okay, so we're, we're, we're the knowledge structures are siloed and isolated, and they don't cohere together to coordinate mm. is and ought mm. in an embodied way that makes any general sense. Instead, we just basically get placed in the institutionalized market structures, mm. uh, and then are left on our own to try to make sense out of what real meaning and value is. Um, and uh, and so we need the the glue functions. There has to be we have to then reconstitute ourselves into a coherent, integrated pluralism, um, and bridging. That, 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 that's what I. That's what I feel like when 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 I'm when I'm speaking and something comes out and I hear I, I feel it register. Mm -hmm. I feel the room shift. Mm -hmm. I think that's what's happening. Is that that disinto that dis, uh, what what you call inc not incoherent pluralistic or chaotic fragmented chaotic. pluralism yeah that can become a coherent integrated pluralism. yeah that i think people glimpse that and they and they and they they feel it for a second i think that's, that's right. what what's happening and 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 that that afford the pluralism affords the individuality it affords the we can maintain our Id unique ideographic place in the world if we maintains our freedom um we can then integrated means take different parts and differentiate coherent means you place them in different parts and then there's an overarching pattern that's orienting and, and it's that that is what we yeah need at a, just at a basic relations of the parts kind of system as opposed to the structure and for me i'm always you know on my, my training and things like that so i i hear that okay and i first off it's beautiful okay so you have the intersection of sort of sci a science big history and nature and art okay which in the academy, as we know, is like mm. <laughs> that's not happening. Merely, there's no department. There's no department. Much, there's we're no not department embodying in that. that. We're yeah. not living that. We're not conveying that to our ourselves. And now I think we're at as as our knowledge systems and as our awakening and as as where we are understanding where we're coming from about the socialization mm. of the modernity and what it did to us and then the awakening that we need to fundamentally evolve. There's a beautiful opportunity here. Yeah. Right? So I hear that. And I hear you use the word I spectralize <laughs> and create an yeah. aspect of, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then I'm immediately like, you know, John and I did the entire untangling yeah. the world not of consciousness. Um, the frame that you that your artist is placing around that, well, that's adverbial qualia. Okay. And the pull is adjectival qualia, which she pulls Whoa. out and places in the frame. Okay. So wow. you know, that's the here-ness, downness, and togetherness that 
creates the index function, that's adverbial qualia. <laughs> and then the properties that pop out are adjectival qualia. Okay. And so now you take the homunculus and you shake up the homunculus, right? And you get the person dropping the homunculus. But actually, it's sort of putting the witness function back in to the structure. And actually, you do have an ego that's kind of a narrator on top mm. of that. So we can actually pull the homunculus out and dissipate it. Also, then reorganize it and drop it back in and have it then be in psyche world, you know, much more coherent harmony. That sounds awesome. Mm -hmm. I love that you can see how it 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 you can see how this interfuses with that deep level philosophical conversation about aspectual you know cognition all that. So, um, that's good. And that to me that's a, and then the potential, John, and and, and you feel this and I feel this realness like we so, we want real you know people and and indeed this current chaotic fragmented pluralism and industrialization and commercialism is. Is felt to be unreal in a particular way. We are mm. hominids. <laughs> we have an entire architecture of big history inside of us that's yeah. waiting to sync up. You know. Yeah, that, that's one of the reasons I've been focusing a lot on like the the first sort of like the earliest art forms. Mm -hmm. It's kind mm -hmm. of like if the if the six year old with the crayfish could create art, what would they create? Well, they'd create crayfish art. They'd create some kind of amalgamation of you know their experience of the crayfish. And so that's why I've started thinking about like how can we how can we in some way remember, you know, what it meant, what it felt like to, to live in that mm -hmm. in that formative moment. Not that we can go back and live that way, but that we can remember that way of being, totally. that way of feeling in the world. And uh, you know, without having to actually forfeit all the comforts of modernity and you know the beautiful knowledge that we've gained but we can somehow restore uh you know paleolithic neolithic sensibilities um in modern well, art totally well i'll show you so, the way it shows up in my past clinical practice and now specifically you talk my coaching philosophy okay i have i very regularly find myself helping people remember that they're an organism mm. that they're an animal, that they're a mammal, and that they're a primate, and that they're a hominid. Okay. So just like you got many go back to childhood, okay, and that's important, you know, uh, go back to the six-year-old state, but you go, not go necessarily go back, but remember you're a stacked nested layer of organismic animal, mammal, primate, hominid processes. But, but there is a, there is a, quality of our particular animalness that no other animal possesses and that is our i don't know if you watched earth the earthling theory video or i did yeah totally okay so Great. there there was a moment six seven million years ago when our what, what would be later become our branch of the yeah. hominid tree so. diverged from what would then become the chimpanzee totally family this is species that we, you know, that we identify as um, Sahelanthropus awesome. chadensis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so there was a moment where some small group of primates left the trees and, you know, crossed the grasslands. And right. then that, that, that act, that moment would eventually turn into the whole human diaspora oh. out of Africa, the whole Absolutely. Homo, Homo sapiens. So we would slowly evolve into what we are now. Right. But, in the course of that journey, our lineage would have had to live in, you know, long, sustained, sequential, intimate, prosperous relationship with every habitat on the planet. Yep. And so when we look at that's unique to us, there mm -hmm. is no other species that has had that long term complete uh, evolutionary lineage, which means that. If, if there is an intelligence to nature that we can mm -hmm. align with, yep. then we have. We have aligned with every ecological scenario Earth has, with the exception of like Antarctica, the bottom of the ocean, da 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 da, -da. Mm -hmm. But the point is that that is a unique lineage that makes us Earthlings like no other animal. Completely. And right. if you need evidence for that, you just look at the line that 
the, the, the Sahelanthropus that didn't leave the trees, that stayed there, would later go on to become chimpanzees. And mm -hmm. they live essentially the same. They never left the trees. Oh. They never had this. And they're still chimpanzees and love chimpanzees, but they're still mm -hmm. like, sure. they're still screaming and yelling and flinging shit at each other. And, you know, not that we don't do that, but the point is, <laughs> you know, they're, they never right. left the trees and they still are chimpanzees. They're still the same. Exactly. So, um, right. So we absolutely need to have the framework for understanding both our continuity uh, and discontinuity. Yes. Uh, and, and there's a fundamental discontinuity uh, that, you know, obviously you talk and the tree of knowledge says actually is our, the best way to delineate is a culture person plane of existence that emerges. Um, yeah. There are grounds or cognitive and social grounds that set the stage for that emergence that make a Skype different. A work of Michael Tomasello um, specifies the ways in which uh, the particular social aspect of our environment creates a much more flexibility that affords an implicit intersubjective fusion of attention mm. and intention. So he calls this intuitive we space. Okay? And then the example of this is just little kids will point, um, or if you point or their point, they'll very quickly understand that there's an intention and shared attention. Okay? Mm. Uh, so in the social environment, we embed ourselves into the minds of others and we sync up with the minds of others. Yeah. I think the point you're making is actually we can sync up with the patterns of nature in a way that's much more flexible. Well, I'm also, also just saying that that capacity is an endowment of the earth itself. Yes. That is, that is an endowment of the earth that, mm -hmm. that other organisms have to some limited or some other mm -hmm. continuous, mm -hmm. you know, on the spectrum of, 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 of it, but that we have elevated it to. There's a, there's a layer of abstraction that are, um, you know, cortex is able to uh, basically achieve, and that that sets us apart. You can see, in many ways, a three-year-old thinks very differently than an adult chimpanzee, and in some ways, quite more sophisticated. Yeah, yeah. And that's shocking. And then, when you add on top of that, in terms of what you know, from a unified theory perspective, then you really get the huh. shift. So you get then symbolic and tactical language and propositions, and then you now get a completely different field that, that opens is, up. Uh, that is fascinating that that's going on on this planet that like that and that that a three-year-old can carry that that endowment that sophisticated endowment lives within every three-year-old somewhere mm -hmm. and then it gets activated in you know it gets activated right. in, in in ways that we can't predict and that you oh. know or that in some ways we can't predict that if you you know given the given a certain mm -hmm. culture you're going to get Right. a certain adult right. <laughs> when i first developed the tree of knowledge and this is in terms of speaking to what i hope happens culturally uh you know this was actually a big fucking shock to me i mean a stone one day it pops out of me on august 1997 september 1997 actually put it up on the wall the original one i drew <laughs> it's really interesting to take a look at because actually at all there's no hesitation i was like talk about remembering mm. it's like mm. how the fuck i actually i mean it just fell out of me with no hesitation really a weird transcendental moment but then very shortly after, in the next one that I drew, okay, I was like, basically in the margins, like, holy shit, I'm the consequence of three miracles. The miracle of life, okay, the miracle of mind, and the miracle of culture, capital C culture, right? And, and in this moment, of course, I'm in the middle of a sort of transcendent visioning, and, and so I'm moved in that regard. But in relationship to that, I now certainly encourage everyone your moment to be able to self-reflect and have this conversation or be a six-year-old and reflect on here I am in relationship to the crayfish. The miracles of energy information complexification that are residing in that spot relative to what we know about the rest of the universe. Mm. Let's say the earth burns like a quasar of complexity yeah. in the night sky. Yeah. And, yeah. You're, and you're at the, at the complexification stack level. That moment is just one of, you know, one, so it's like, it's a, and it's a miracle stacked upon a miracle stacked upon a miracle. Um, and, and if we we are able to relate to that that way, I mean, there's a real justified sacredness of the being itself that is unbelievably unique, unbelievably rare, needs to be protected and child, yeah. cherished. And, and this is going on. How absurd is it that we we're, we say we're in a meaning crisis? Like, all right, this is so available to you. Like, but that's what happened. The justificatory system actually, you know, says you're a bunch of chemicals or how much money do you make? I mean, the narrative, the egoic narrative on top of the primate is going to yeah. come back and basically internalize the standards and be, 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 be a And I can tell you lots of reasons why it gets all wa waffled into some nightmare in of, a, of a particular entanglement. Yeah, lots right. of reasons it can do that. And that's mm -hmm. why our socialization story, the big, big history origin story told properly 
And this is what sort of big history is like, well, if we have a coherent science, no, it's actually embodied meaning of this at the perspectival right. hominid right. level of the relationship to a tree or, or your lover in an embodied way. It's that really, and that, that, that is, that's the fundamental richness. I, I have to wonder sometimes, like if somebody drops in on a conversation like this, are they like, what the fuck are those two talking about? <laughs> or, or, you know, cause I don't know. It just seems like the, the, our work is cut out for us in some ways. Like, okay, mm -hmm. okay. So how, where do we go? From? Like, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm sign me up for that, for that ride. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's like, are we just like deluded here? Like what, and who's deluded? Like, by the way, like, <laughs> like, I don't know. I just feel like it requires a lot of courage and faith and audacity to assume that we're saying anything useful here. Is this is there anything even rational here? I sometimes I don't know. Or is this yeah. just are we just yeah. ranting? Like I don't know. Yeah, I, I would, well I don't okay, I'll say I don't feel that way. I I mean I at least so I'll speak for myself. And and part of this I will say, I mean, you know, I do come from a very strong scientific background with a fairly yeah. skeptical, analytical professor father. So yeah. I've definitely you talk is designed to answer the question towards the skeptical academic. I mean, that's what mm -hmm. it is fundamentally mm -hmm. designed to justify itself right. yeah. in front of the heart. You get me, the physicists, the biologists, the psychologists, the sociologists, and the ethicists, yeah. and get them in front of me and throw lawyer-like questions to attack this thing. This thing is designed to withstand that level of critique. That's what yeah. it's structured to. Sure. And, and I think, and at least we'll see uh, whether it can. Now, I do feel like, oh my God, this can really make a difference. There is a skeptical and, and questioning part of me is like, and do I know what's going to happen in relationship to it? And and where is that? All of that is unbelievably ambiguous. And, and I have mm -hmm. got faith in that. Um, I don't really have much choice because my soul and spirit are already aligned and they're going to drive me to sure. do what I'm doing sure. unless some weird thing happens uh, uh, going forward. But but yeah, that's, so for me, at least, I, I'm i happy with Utah's capacity to withstand the strongest analytical skepticism that can be brought to bear on it um, and hold with justification. Uh, at least that's my felt sense of it. No, I, I get the sense too. I, and I, I you like that. I mean, I get the sense that you're doing that and that requires a, you know, a heightened level of integrity and analysis and all of that stuff. And so it's a tough audience, <laughs> but. Uh, right. Well, I, mean, I can't sell it to them, but I can at least in my head uh, respond to them. So that's the, that's but the, nobody ever could, you know, yeah, no, like that's, know. that, oh, you know, this is and certainly that's not the way it works. I know. And you sign up for this, right? Yeah, totally. And <laughs> believe me, I'm a super happy camper in terms yeah, of yeah, my little like garden. A... You know, it's an unbelievable. I've been able, I've been able to find my primate, right? Yeah. And and be able to see it and and, and yeah. realize it and create my little garden and fantasize about it. Listen, folks, the 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 trees are and flowers are great here. You know, and the bees they fly around. It's a really wonderful way of being in the world. And let's see what happens. So. So do you have any thoughts or do you want to try and maybe um, uh, predict what's going to happen, you know, in the short term here with, uh, you know, the different players like that are, that are in this, the game B people, the, the rebel wisdom stuff, the, the, the John Verveke orbits, the. Right. What do you um, think? I, uh, I don't know. I, I, I certainly, I'm sort of, I'm definitely in a wait and see kind of mode. Uh, so mm. I'll uh, I, um, you know, when it first started, it was all sorts of enthusiasm pretty quickly after the enthusiasm began to subside, I say by 2020, mm -hmm. um, my analysis was sort of like, okay, there are a lot of interesting voices here. This is an interesting community that can form relationships and have conversation. Um, I don't see a lot of evidence that it has opportunity for genuine generative mechanisms, uh, to grab a hold of the current structure of the culture and make any difference. I'm seeing uh, that though. Well, this is, I'm not you. done yet. Yeah. I'm not done yet. So this is where if you ask me like where the hope is and things like that, where the, you know, but so, so, and then I think that there are key aspects of that that are essentially playing themselves out. You know, rebel wisdom is going to uh, uh, dissolve. And, you know, we had, there was an emerge conference, North America, and that went okay. Um, and at the same time, you know, there are then I, so I think we're in a phase development. Uh, where certain things are getting consolidated, new relationships are forming. And I am seeing, like at least in the, con the corner of you talk, the corner of you talk is more and more people are like, okay, I want to translate this into something that I, you know, that I can state with clarity, but more importantly, embody and, and make real. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. 
And so that's happening and I'm excited about that. And then there are these other opportunities that are actually like, okay, here's a generative pathway. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and of course, now this is what I was saying, bringing back to you is like, if I listen to you, your story, you're actually at an epicenter of potential generative pathway. I mean, it's hard to see exactly what would be the, but if you're like, Hey, if there's an attentional influence mechanism, which is what are necessary to actually create generative pathways, you're actually in a broadcast function, right? That then is then hearing systems are now hearing that actually have all sorts of potential. And it's like, you know, and I'm seeing some of those is not just this, but, but that's one good example. It's like, Hmm, that if, when that leverage happens, then you can really start to see the generative mechanism. So, right. so that's a cusp of a generative mechanism that gives me like, Oh, that's a path I could see really explode. Yeah. Well, and that's, again, I, 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 I see that too. I don't know how I've been at this a while, you know, and I've seen, I've seen, you know, there was, the world was different though. The last time I, really pushed strong to, to mm -hmm. you know, to have to break in and uh, it wasn't ready. It was before it's time. Mm -hmm. um, but I am seeing like, again, I'm seeing now a kind of receptiveness that I hadn't seen before. And that's, that's promising. It's also good to know that you're holding that front line in, mm -hmm. you know, in, in academia. And I think, you know, <laughs> stay, stay with it, Greg, you know, hold well, the yeah. line, Greg, hold the <laughs> <This> line. Is... <laughs> reinforcements are coming <laughs> and, right, I can well, already, I, and i can know. already see there are some people on on the on you know on the other side of your of your front mm. um you know they're 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 having second thoughts about what they're trying to defend yeah yeah well that's you know there it is uh, i will certainly uh my soul and spirit is already locked in so i will continue to do that i know what you mean uh, and uh <laughs> you know um so and and i'm really no I mean, meaning crisis here no meaning crisis here. <laughs> uh, you wake up uh, and go to bed with meaning all the yes. time. So, um, so yeah, I, I think it's super exciting. I think you and I should continue to circle around, circle around with John. I'd be really interested to continue to explore. As I, uh, as I told you off camera, but I'll say it here. You know, st Stone thinking a little bit of the other day, and people that know you talk know one of my framings on this is Mary the coin, which of course is the psyche and its layer to the tree with. His, my, you know, from the scientific perspective, in the garden under God, and and the energy information alignment of those two vectors inside and out, um, and the symbolism of the coin as my currency uh, relative to the ecology that I'm in, uh, mm -hmm. that synergy all of a sudden popped as oika to me, and uh, that was a beautiful. And so you and I, had, you didn't know it, but you and I had a little bit of fusion in here. Well, in it's, this because room it's, a a it's because <laughs> it's, it's, it's a good idea. It's because it's a good idea. It's because it's a good idea, and it's. It's not my idea. It's the mm -hmm. idea that needs to happen. You know, it's the mm -hmm. idea that wants to be expressed. And I got to tell you, though, you know, I, 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 I'm kind of feeling like it's the, the mid '90s again. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what I tried to do with you know the cable TV when it was happening, I'm trying to do now with crypto. And you know, it it, it feels a little before its time that yeah. that crypto isn't. Uh, let's just say, put it this way. Like I I heard uh, Daniel Smachtenberg talking about. He said something about. I don't know. He just articulated Oika. You know, mm -hmm. he, he wasn't articulating Oika, but right. he, but I heard him say, "Yeah, mm -hmm. we need to align our incentives with these." Yep, totally. You know, yes. And and you know, and I've and I've been knocking at you know Web 3's door, and I've had a few mm -hmm. programmers mm -hmm. on board, and but then it just fizzles, and it's just like there's not enough there's not enough psychic energy in that in that work in that that niche yet mm -hmm. to to for this organism to survive. I'm hoping that changes soon, uh, but re I, I'm really hopeful about regenerative finance mm -hmm. and what that what that can become if we can get through this awkward adolescent phase of crypto. Totally. Yeah. You know? Well, I like to say this is the behavioral investment theory coin. It's a different kind of Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> but we can make an associative adjacent identity to it. All right, that's good. <laughs> well, if while we're on the sub, while we're on the thread of sharing uh, clever. Uh, acronyms. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking about how you know a lot of your insights come from times when you're you know when you when you're high. You admit yeah, it, and totally uh, so this should be called you token, not you talking. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, exactly. I certainly do talk about hey tokers in the TOK society sometimes. Well, that's yeah, the other so. thing I wanted to ask you. Like you've got a really great conversation. You've got a lot of really great conversations going on there. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you like? You know, there's real deep thinkers and energized people, and mm -hmm. and. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's a it's a it's a great sort of lively conversation that you've got going on there. That's uh, 
there's some developments there, no? I mean, there's some. Yeah, I mean, so you know, the the system I think is in a particular again sort of phase of evolution at the level of so now you know a lot of my intellectual focus is getting this book done, the problem of psychology yeah. and new and new vision for a solution. I have that now basically done. Um, the back half of this year is to consolidate Utah, you know, and that yeah. means that's a talk society. Um, yeah. That's clear, you know, getting the Utah 20, which is an outline of that, uh, getting each one of the parts clarified. I'm doing a vision. I'm doing, I'll probably be slowing down you talking with Greg and creating what's called now you talking, which is a ser video series on definitions and key concepts. Um, so we're starting, I've generated six of those five to 10 minutes each. There are 40 of them we've laid out um, and I'm working on that. So so what I mean by that ultimately then in relationship to like the society is like we need to shift where the energy of the conversation is. We need to create another layer like of a newsletter. Um, we also need a conference. I'm, I'm planning potentially a talk society conference in April. I'll be talking about Do you, have a, you have a venue lined up for that? Uh, well, it'd be, it would be a Zoom conference right now. I've done, mm -hmm. I did some at JMU in the past, but I think where everybody is at this juncture, um, the ease of the... Yeah, uh, but but down the road certainly there would be venues that I would be want to be I, in person. I've been fantasizing about you know asking people to come out here and mm, well, because we've got the facilities like I would it, certainly, especially you know. in the shoulder season you know like mm -hmm. in the summertime mm -hmm. it's it's very much a, mm -hmm. a chaos right, but right. Uh, but on the shoulder seasons it's gorgeous and it's and it just so happens that you know we have facilities uh, not at the level of like a university but. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It, 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 I've just been toying with the idea. I don't know. It, it's hard to get people to find find the time to travel, yeah. and you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's something that I've been thinking about. Well, um, let's, well, let's uh, definitely circle back to that conversation because uh, yeah, okay, you know cool. that's the whole. Um, yeah. So anyway, those are the so, and then basically, can we consolidate the message? Get clarity about it. You know, explore the mental health implications. Explore meaning crisis. Network with other systems to figure out ways to connect really yeah. connect this with nature, connect it with art. And uh, as long as that tapestry keeps happening, we'll keep. Okay, cool. All right. Well, I'm excited to see how your book, um, you know, how it gets, how it lands, how it gets received. It, um, it, it, I put it in an academic, so it's an academic context. I know, so, but, but I'm excited but, to see how it lands there. You know, yeah, that's so. uh, any, 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 when do you expect to like ha have some clarity on how how it's well, I mean, I'm submitting it to the publisher. It takes about six months usually for it to get finalized. Okay. So, so we'll, not, so we'll, has, it will come out in June. Yet. Oh, okay. no, it has not. And uh, it's in Paul Gray McMillan's like Springer or whatever. So it's a general. Um, but what I will be able to do then once it's out is just, you know, some people will read it. <laughs> and then it'll be really clear about, okay, this is the argument. And and now it's, well, a, very, it's a very specific, you know, it is contained within the academic psychology field. It's sure. I don't actually mention Gordon or Coyne or anything like that. It's an art. It's a structural okay. argument in relation, but it situates, it does, it's all about the enlightenment gap that produced the problem of psychology and then how the unified theory solves the problem of psychology and ergo sets the stage for resolving the enlightenment gap and setting the stage for a new enlightenment. That is, Mark, and, I, and I think it's a pretty tight argument. I do too. <laughs> I think it's brilliant. So <laughs> it'd be good so, to see how that works out. But, right. but well, again, that. hold the front, Greg, hold yeah, the front. I mean, I'll be doing my thing. <laughs> all, all right, right brother. Really Take nice talking easy. with you. You too. Take care.